Thank you, Kung Fu. Bonjour, Kung Fu, and bonjour, Montréal. Um, I'm going to be talking about age discrimination in tech. Um, you're probably thinking, oh, he's going to say age discrimination is bad, we shouldn't do it. Um, but I'm not going to say that, A, because I don't like to be predictable, uh, and B, because I don't want to make a value judgment here. So I'm, I'm merely going to highlight some ideas that are floating around, uh, let you make you draw your own conclusions, and, um, and usually uh, the feedback that I get after a talk is, uh, um, Rommel, I think I disagree with everything that you said, but I have to think about it. Um, because, because, you know, age discrimination, does it exist? Um, so there's a chart, shows the sort of distribution of, uh, of the working age population in the United States. Um, it's roughly 42. In the tech industry, the average age is uh, roughly 29. Um, and uh, this may be due to discrimination, but it also may be due to the fact that younger people are um, just better at it than older people. <laughs> there's our chart was provide a definition of uh, uh, rational astrologies, which is a term that I got from a gentleman uh, called Steve Randy Waldman, who has a blog, Interfluidity, and it's a great thing. And the idea of a rational astrology is a rational astrology is a thing that you believe, <clears throat> that you act as if you believe it, whether you believe it or not, which is to say, um, if you don't believe it, you believe that everybody else believes it, and so therefore you behave as if it's true even if you think that it is not. And the example that he gives on his blog post when he talks about it is, um, you know, if you're looking to hire two people, somebody, and you have two resumes, and one of them is a Harvard graduate and the other one is a high school dropout, but otherwise their experience and everything else is exactly the same, right? <clears throat> you might hire one or the other, uh, but if you hired the person who was the high school dropout um, and then they didn't work out, all of your associates would say, well, you know, that was a pretty bad decision. I mean, you should be able to tell he's a high school dropout. You know, there's no, you should have expected that it wouldn't work out. Whereas if you hired the Harvard graduate, um, everybody would say, um, well, you know, there was no way you could have known he wasn't going to work out. I mean, he was a hired Harvard graduate. Um, and so you make the decision to go with the person who has the Ivy League school on their resume, even if you've read the research and you know that that actually has nothing to do with the odds that they will be successful or not. Um, and ooh, the kind of rational astrology um, that uh, is kind of prevalent in this room, the one that I like to use as an example, is I read Alfie Cohn, who writes a lot about rewards and the effectiveness of rewards and uh, the most... A uh, thoroughly researched result in, in, in sociology is the fact that if you give people rewards for creative tasks, uh, it decreases performance. Uh, and everybody knows this, and it's, it decreases performance among the people who get the reward because they perform more poorly, and it decreases performance among the people who don't get the reward because they also perform even more poorly. Um, and yet, we all, even if we've read the research and we say, oh yeah, I, I can see how that's true, we know that everybody else thinks that, it is, uh, that, that that's not really the case, and so everybody continues to give people rewards. So, um, the problem is that all of us in this room, we have these rational astrologies. There's things that we believe that as a result of those beliefs, we say, well, it's not really a good idea to hire old people for a tech job. Uh, and so I'm going to highlight three of those because three is all the time that I, all the ones that I have time for. Actually, I only have time to do two, um, but I went to Catholic school and so I have to do everything in threes. Um, and so the threes uh, are, uh, these are rational astrologies. Uh, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, experience isn't valuable, and the latter is for climbing, and I will explain each of these three, but those are the three sections of the talk. See, the difficulty with the rational astrology is if, if I present evidence that what you believe is false, you will continue to behave as if you believe that it is true, because until I have convinced you that everybody else in the world also thinks it's false, you're going to you're going to think that they you've been convinced, but no, you know everybody else hasn't been convinced, so you're going to continue to act as they are. So it is Im virtually impossible to convince people to stop behaving as if their rational astrology is true. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. <sighs> so in mathematics, the Fields Medal can only be awarded to a mathematician who is under 40 years of age. That's what it says. Um, you know, if you, if you read um, G.H. Hardy's autobiography, he talks about how mathematics you know, you should never forget it's a young man's game. Old people really can't do mathematics. And to the extent that we believe that software development is a mathematical exercise because it has algorithms, clearly everybody knows that um, 
better to hire young people. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg in 2007 very famously gave an interview and we, she said, you know, young people are just smarter, right? Why are most chess masters under the age of 30? Clearly everybody knows this. Vinod Kosla in 2018 gave an interview in which he said people under 35 are the people who make the changes. People over 45 are basically dead in terms of new ideas. <laughs> now, I can show you a chart that says completely wrong. Right, so this is a study that was done by MIT, U.S. Census Bureau, Northwest University. They looked at 2.7 million company founders, and they categorized them by age groups, and they looked at the ones that started just startups, the ones that did high-growth startups, and the average age of the founders of high-growth startups is 45. Right? In fact, if you look at the chart, you will see the, 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 the lighter colored bar is the high-growth um, startups. That people over 60 found as many high-growth startups as people under 29. Right? But the sweet spot is up there in the 40s and 50s. Right? So, you know, a 50-year-old founder is almost two times more likely to create a high-growth startup than a 30-year-old. Right? But Vinod Kosla goes, you know, but no, you're never going to get investors to behave as if that is true. Because they think all the other investors think it's different. But the most difficult one of all is this book by Thomas Kuhn that he wrote in, uh, 19, published in 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This is a must read in, uh, in uh, uh, history of science uh, courses and whatnot. And I'm sure most of you in the room have read the book, or if not, uh, certainly a precis of the book. Mostly it's famous because, because the word paradigm, when he published this book, was this uh, uh, medieval term that wasn't really used by anybody. And he used the word extensively in this book. So if you've ever heard or used the word paradigm, it's because uh, it came from uh, this book, which resuscitated the term. And basically what he said was, we'd like to believe that science is this thing that advances because because people come up with hypotheses and then they run experiments and they collect data and then they prove the validity of the hypothesis and then they move on. Uh, they come up with a new hypothesis and collect data and do experiments and so forth. And that that is, in fact, if you study the history of science, not the way that it works. The way that it actually works, says Thomas Kuhn is that somebody comes up with an idea, a hypothesis, they run an experiment, they collect new data, they prove that their idea is correct and nobody believes them. The nobody who doesn't believe them are the old guys who run the science uh, establishment. And I say old guys because it's always old guys. <clears throat> and what you have to do, according to Thomas Kuhn, is wait for them to die. <laughs> and then after they're dead, your ideas finally get some traction and now you are the old guy. And some new guy comes along with an idea and does some experiments and collects some data and proves that they're right and you say, no, I don't believe it. <laughs> and that that's how science advances and everybody knows this to be true. Right? <clears throat> so there is no conceivable way that I can convince you that you should behave as if it's not true because in fact it isn't because it is a rational astrology and you continue to do that. So my only line of attack on this notion that old people are not innovative uh, and, uh, and uh, you shouldn't hire them in an innovative industry because that would uh, be anti-competitive, uh, is to argue that it doesn't matter that old people are less innovative than young people because we are not living in an innovative age. See, we like to convince ourselves that we are living in an innovative age and the internet and uh, mobile telephony and, and we have all of these inventions and time is, progress is getting faster and faster and faster and faster, but the research of course shows that that is not true. <clears throat> so this uh, study was undertaken to try to determine um, innovation. It was actually a, a study with, uh, related to economics, whether or not you could model economics with a model that showed that there was an economic limit, limit to innovation or there was no limit, economic limit to innovation. And uh, he went through and collected data on innovation and the metric used to measure innovation worldwide was to say the number of inventions uh, per year per millions of you know, uh, people in, in terms of population, which is to say the argument being if there were a billion people on the earth and we had a million inventions a year, um, and then 10 years later we came back and there were 2 billion people on the earth and 1.5 million inventions a year, you could argue, hey, we're 50% more innovative because we have 50% more innovation going on, or you could argue we're 25% less innovative because we have twice as many people but only 50% more innovation going on. So on average, people are less innovative than they used to be. And so 
when he graphs all of this stuff uh, and does sort of the, the Gaussian smoothing or whatever, the peak of that curve is in 1873. And it's been declining ever since. A uh, study was done in 2005, but then does projections based on the, on the curve fitting. And so by 2020, if you look at it, we're approximately as innovative as they were in 1452, just before the invention of the printing press. How many people think this is a good, valid study and agree with the conclusions? I have four hands. Thank you. <clears throat> so then I uh, looked at life expectancy. So life expectancy, and the data set uh, from England is the only one that goes back to the 1500s. Life expectancy throughout the world charted see, uh, back into uh, almost the Middle Ages, which is flat at 40 for the longest time. And then all of a sudden, life expectancy starts to increase. <laughs> right there. Which, if you look at the uh, x-axis, would seem to be right around 1873. So right around 1873, we start to get people being older and older and older. And if old people were less innovative than young people, you would expect that the average rate of innovation would decrease starting in 1873. And you would get an innovation rate that looks something like this. Franchement, ça tourne pas rond, ça fait, hein? Experience is not valuable. Aha! Everybody says, ah ha, uh, I don't believe that. Experience is a good thing. I'll just take a show of hands. How many people think experience is valuable? Yes, we're almost good. Everybody in, agrees with this statement. So I have a bunch of reference works. All of these things, uh, charts and whatever that I'm throwing up, I have uh, URLs on the bottom if you want to check me out. And it's the question that got asked by this uh, study that looked at the methodology and culture of uh, technical organizations was, is the concept you know, <clears throat> of having a methodology a driver of mediocrity? And of course, the answer is yes, pretty much by definition, right? Why do people have methodologies in software development? Because uh, they want to reduce the standard deviation, right? The idea of a methodology is not to make people better, it's to make people the same. It's to be able to be predictable, right? It's about being able to have most people be close to the average. And that is an aspiration to mediocrity, All right? <clears throat> So, programmers and managers, the routinization of high-tech work, right? What is most remarkable, I'm quoting from this book which came out in 1977, what is most remarkable about the work programmers do is how quickly it has been transformed. Barely a generation after its inception, prologging, programming is no longer the complex work of creative and perhaps even eccentric people. Instead, divided and routinized, it has become mass production work parceled out to interchangeable detail workers. Some software specialists still engage in intellectually demanding and rewarding work, people who are called by such names as system engineers or analysts or software scientists, but they make up a relatively small and diminishing proportion of the total workforce. The great and growing mass of people called programmers do work which is less and less distinguishable from that of clerks or, for that matter, assembly line workers. 1977. And I have one word for you. Agile. <laughs> this book, in the name of efficiency, goes into greater detail. They quote each other. <clears throat> Um, which 
came out around the same time, also in the 70s. Um, and, and this looks at specific cases of this happening, because you're saying, oh, well, no, I mean, maybe it happened here or there. But it was actually a program for which there's documentation, which they go through uh, in this book in the name of efficiency. So management embarked on a program to separate the decision-making tasks of programming for the, from the more routine physical tasks of operating the computer. This kind of division of labor had proved quite successful in factory production one which Karl Marx described as the division between the hand labor and the head labor. Dividing conceptual tasks like programming from executable work such as operations did not occur throughout the industry at the same time. Its first enforced appearance was in the aerospace industry in the mid-1950s. So yes, <clears throat> the reason we have the dev team and the ops team is because it was a management program <clears throat> to de-skill the eccentric people who did sort of all the computer stuff. <clears throat> um, AT&T, famous for developing Unix and all those kinds of things. They had a, a job classification scheme, which when the computer depar department came in, there was a culture shock. So AT&T avoided this problem by leaving all computer positions clerical and continued their standard practice of hiring women for clerical slots. AT&T's extensively divided labor and fully rationalized procedures were unusual for their time, but separation of the head labor from the hand labor took several computer generations to become enforceable. Anyway, there's more you can read the book, but if you say, oh, these people are just, you know, socialists who are quoting Karl Marx, <clears throat> we have to go back to Charles Babbage in 1832. You think 1977 was an old reference. All right, so Charles Babbage, and I, and I got this quote from Labor and Monopoly Capital. The subtitle is The Degradation of Work in the 20th Century, uh, who quotes Charles Babbage as saying, the greatest savings is embodied in the analysis of the process, and a further saving, the extent varying within the nature of the process, is to be found among the separation of operations among different workers. The master manufacturer, by dividing the work to be executed into different processes, each requiring different degrees of skill or force, can purchase exactly the precise quantity of both which is necessary for each process. If you think about it, this is not unreasonable. The whole point of automation is to routinize work and make it and replace labor with machines. And we're talking about now as if it's this new idea that, oh, we have to worry about AIs taking away people's jobs. Charles Babbage invented the computer to take away people's jobs in 1832, and we've been working at it ever since, getting more and more successful at it. <clears throat> so what does this have to do with my original thesis where I said experience isn't valuable? Well, the first thing is management has been trying for 30 or 50 or 100 years, depending on which of these books you like best, to make the work of software people less and less require uh, experience and uh, creativity and a variety of skills. But what I have as the coup de grace is the software cost estimation model known as Kokomo. Uh, so this book, Kokomo 2, the new version of Kokomo came out in 2000 because Kokomo is the standard industry way of estimating software projects in which you take all of the things about the project and you run it through this formula which uh, Barry Bohm came up with um, and has been refining uh, through the decades and that'll predict how long uh, you know, the, the, uh, the development will take. And of course, the formula takes into account various things that are different about your organization versus other organizations. So it'll be things like what kinds of tooling you have and what kinds of uh, experience you have. So there's various multipliers for, for all of these various things. And so one says, so what is the experience multiplier? And the thing is, there are various grades of experience. And the highest grade of experience, the very highest grade of experience for which you get a... Um, 160% you know, bump in your effectiveness is six years of experience. And you know this is true because at your organization, you have junior devs and mid-range devs and senior devs. And the junior dev is what, zero to two years? And the mid-range is what, two to four years? And the senior is what? More than four, it says. But it's not true. It's four to six because six is the maximum. <laughs> and everybody knows that. So what does that mean? It means you graduate from university at 22 or 24 if you're getting your master's degree, and you work for six years in the industry and get six years, the maximum amount of experience, and now you're 29 or 30 years old. <clears throat> 
So think about it. You know, if, you, if your organization was going to hire somebody who had 20 years of experience, how much more would they pay for that than for six years of experience? The ultra super experienced dev. And the answer is you don't have a grade for that. You pay the same for 15 years of experience as six years of experience. So what I'm saying is, <clears throat> The incremental value of experience after six years is zero, <clears throat> meaning experience isn't worth anything, which is kind of where I started this whole thing. Because if you're of a certain age, you spend most of your career with more than six years of experience. <laughs> and I just leave you with one further thought, which is from Google. Um, that uh, paragon of uh, top-tier technology talents, which is uh, the reason they developed Go was because, you know, they hire young, fresh out of college people who are not capable of understanding a brilliant language. And so the language that we have to give them has to be simple, easy to understand. In fact, you hear that all the time in the tech industry. The value of a programming language, it's a better programming language if it's easy to understand. And what does that mean? It means, well, I don't want people with experience. All right. <clears throat> Lastly, the ladder is for climbing. What do I mean by that? Uh, first time I gave this talk, I did not have this section. And uh, in the pub, a uh, little bit uh, you know, after the talk, uh, I was having a beer with some guy who said, you know, I would never hire somebody who is uh, over 35 to be a programmer. Because the fact that they're over 35 and still working as a programmer proves that they have no ambition. And why would you want to hire somebody with no ambition? Which is an excellent point. You don't want to hire somebody who's got no ambition. <clears throat> so this talk was, uh, was, uh, was motivated by a blog post that Tim Bray did in which he talked about sort of the issue of the old geek wanting to stay technical. Um, and then arguing, of course, that when you're an old geek, um, you, 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 you add more um, value by doing non-technical things, you know, mentoring and managing and planning and all of those kinds of things. <clears throat> and so I had to run over time on my talk today in order to talk about this section. Because this book, which I read when I was in high school in the 1960s, informed my career. I tried to live by the precepts in this book for 40 years. And unfortunately, the book has faded into obscurity and nobody remembers what it says. But this information is so valuable that I need, felt the need to share it with you today. The Peter Principle is a principle that states that in any organization, people will keep getting promoted until they reach their level of incompetence. And then the rest of it is a case study showing how that is true. And of course, it is obviously true immediately upon inspection, which is to say, you get hired, you're doing a job. If you're not doing a very good job, they're not going to promote you. But you do a good job because you're an excellent junior programmer. So they promote you. And then you do a good job there, and they promote you. And then you do a good job there, and they say, oh, you're really good. We'll promote you to management. And you're not so good with people. <laughs> so you don't do so good there. So now they can't promote you. But you know, it used to be good. You've been around a long time, so they keep you on. But they don't promote you. Um, so in an organization, the MQ, the maturity quotient, is the, um, the number of people, and he divides a term, when you've reached your level of incompetence, and you are so incompetent that you cannot be promoted, you have reached final placement. <laughs> and the maturity quotient of an organization is the percentage of people who have achieved final placement. And in older, larger organizations, very corporate, uh, you have a maturity quotient approaching 100. Everybody is incompetent. And some of you may have worked in some of these organizations. Now they, <clears throat> so there's several things to take away from this. <clears throat> so the first is, you know, there's a ladder. And they move you up the ladder, right? When you're junior, you do coding. But then you get promoted to be an architect. Right? And if you're not good at that, of course, then you'll stall out there and you'll be an incompetent architect for the rest of your career. <clears throat> And then, you know, if you're good at that, they'll promote you to do people management, you know, and eventually they might even promote you to be corporate management where you're mostly worried about backdating stock options and so on, financial <laughs> gimmicks like that. <clears throat> <All right. clears throat> 
Now, what people don't do, and I, I have had the, the great fortune of, 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 of having done this at least four times in my career, what they, people don't do is they don't demote you back to a place where you could be excellent, where you could be your old 10x self. <clears throat> because, and they don't do it, here's a rational astrology for you, because you would be unhappy. Well, if we demote that person, you know, they'll be unhappy and they'll leave. <clears throat> well, two things. One, they're incompetent, so why is that a problem? And two, <clears throat> if you demoted them back to that job that they were so good at that you promoted them out of it, maybe they would be happier, right, than being an incompetent boob in the job that you currently have them in. So I actually, uh, my, my greatest achievement was, uh, was I was actually in a job where I went in, where into my boss during uh, promotion season, and I said, I want to you know, promote that person. Um, and they said, well, what do you want to promote them to? I said, I want them to promote them to do my job. I said, well, then what are you going to do? I said, I want you to demote me to do their job. <laughs> and I sold it. <laughs> but, you know, the object, well, you know, that would make you unhappy. Don't tell me what makes me happy or unhappy, like I know better than you do. <laughs> um, so yeah, so four times during my career, I have wound up working for somebody who used to work for me because I've engineered that because I read the, this book. <clears throat> yeah. And tried to live my, my life by its precepts. Uh, and I've been fortunate enough to work with people who've, uh, who've, uh, who have, I've been able to sell on the advantage of advantages of this, but most people work in an organization, and you yourself might be the kind of person where if you were approached uh, to say, uh, would, you, would you mind uh, you know, doing us all a favor and demoting that person? Um, you wouldn't. <clears throat> and if you did, they might want to be demoted because they're doing a bad job, but they would take the demotion because even though it might make them feel better because now they're doing a job that they're better at doing than they used to be doing, they'll think that everybody else thinks that it reflects poorly on them and they wouldn't be able to live with the shame and so they'll leave and go somewhere else and they'll be unhappy because they expect everybody to, to make them be unhappy. So, <clears throat> we believe the ladder is for climbing. We don't believe that people can be happy uh, with no ambition at the age of 35 still wanting to be a programmer because they're a great programmer and so um, we promote them to their level of incompetence and then Finally, the reason is, of course, the maturity quotient is if you take a look at a bunch of older people, people in their 50s and 60s, they've all arrived at final placement. So it's demonstrably provable that old people are basically incompetent because <laughs> they're all doing jobs they're not very good at. Why would you want to hire somebody like that? So now you understand how it works. You can all feel better about doing it the way that you're doing it. And I thank you for your attention.